Hello, I'm Rachel Neville, and today I'm going to give a tutorial on persistence images, which is a method for vectorizing persistence diagrams. Let's start with um, an example. Say I have a set of data that I would like to classify or cluster based on differences in topological structure. So here I have some representatives from a data set generated from the link twist map. This is a discrete time dynamical system. And after a number of iterations of this map, we have a point cloud with some structure that depends on the underlying parameter in the system. And I also want to note that this can vary fairly significantly based on the initial conditions that you feed the map. So we're going to take these um, examples, compute the persistence diagram, and we can see that the persistence diagram really nicely captures um, this void structure that we're seeing in, um, in the data. So I have kind of these long um, H1 bars or several of them for um, the voids that are appearing in my data. Okay, so while persistence diagrams are equipped with ways to measure the distance between them, for example, the bottleneck distance is, um, finds the, the largest distance in a minimal matching, this is a huge simplification of the whole um, set of data that's available to you. Um, there might be um, some interesting differences in um, kind of the shorter bars here. And also, if you just have a distance between persistence diagrams, this really limits um, the machine learning techniques that are available to you. If you want to use some standard methods like the support vector machine or logistic regression, you're going to need a vector representation for each persistence diagram. And so that's where persistence images comes in. Persistence images provides a vectorization of the persistence diagram and um, provides this bridge to connect to a wide array of machine learning techniques. So let's um, take um, an example, compute the persistence diagram. Here we're using um, the Viatoris RIPS filtration on the two-dimensional point cloud. And I'm showing you H1 because that's where um, the most interesting action on this example is. And we're going to transform my data from birth death coordinates to birth persistence coordinates to begin with, because I don't expect there to be um, any points below the diagonal. And so we're just going to get rid of that area. Okay. So we're aiming to vectorize this data. So let's talk about why we can't just take the easy route and do a simple binning approach. So if I have a, um, a diagram in birth persistence coordinates and I overlay a grid, I could um, just count up the number of points in each of these bins. And this does give you a vector representation, um, but this is not stable, which means that a small change in the original data, which would result in a small change in your persistence diagram, could cause a point to move just a little bit in, um, in the diagram, which would change your binning count and actually cause a larger difference between the vectors. So um, a small change in data could actually lead to a large change in the vector representation. And the presence of noise or measurement error in data is unavoidable. So the tools that we choose to use need to be stable with respect to small perturbations in input. So to counter this, we're going to center a differentiable probability distribution at each point in our diagram. A common choice here is the normalized symmetric Gaussian. Um, here we have a, a mean of u and a variance of sigma squared in this example. We're going to um, take that and produce a persistence surface as a weighted sum of all of these um, distributions. So um, this is important for the representation to be stable. So I just want to talk briefly about these weighting functions. So here's two examples. A really common choice is just a linear weight function where you weight um, points with zero persistence 
um, a very small persistence, very small, and then linearly scale up to weight the largest um, persistence point as um, the largest value. And so, um, so this is kind of a standard method. Um, it weights everything fairly um, equally. And so we can see here in our persistence image that um, I have kind of these two points um, give me these two, um, two little blurps in my um, surface, but there's only two of them. Down here where I have a large number of points, they all, even though they're weighted small, they all add up um, and create a fairly significant feature. Um, another choice that we might use is um, a bump function. So if you want to emphasize these um, larger persistence um, features, maybe um, you would choose a bump function that, um, that weights these much more heavily. Um, and in this example, um, weights the points with small persistence um, very um, lightly. And then the middle persistence points are kind of um, in this middle range. And so there's maybe some more interesting um, features there. So this would be a choice that you make based on your data. Um, the conditions on the weighting function are that it's continuous, zero along the horizontal axis, and piecewise differentiable. Functions that are non-decreasing um, in Y here work well, like a sigmoidal function or a piecewise linear function. Okay, so we're gonna proceed just with the linear weight function. It's a fairly standard choice. You take your surface now, overlay a grid, and integrate over each pixel, and that will give you your persistence image, which if you would like, you can transform into a vector. Okay, so to highlight just a few, um, a few things here, we have a good degree of flexibility um, in this representation. For example, the choice in probability distribution, the parameters um, for that distribution, um, the resolution of your persistence image that you might choose, uh, and the weighting function. So, um, so this is nice because if you have some knowledge of your data, you might um, build that into some of the choices that you make. What we've seen anecdotally is that, for example, there's um, there, the results are, uh, machine learning results are fairly stable. Um, when the resolution is varied um, for kind of wide ranges of re resolution. If you get to be too coarse, then maybe it um, decreases your accuracy in, um, in classification, but you have um, kind of a wide range there where you get similar results. And then um, just to reiterate that this is a stable representation. So um, this is provably stable, the, the persistence surface um, with the Gaussian distribution is stable with respect to the one Wasserstein distance between two diagrams. So that means that this is a good choice to use for um, data. And then just a few considerations if you're using this on sets of data. Um, it's important to standardize across the whole set um, so that your persistence images all have the same underlying um, scale. You might use the largest persistence to generate across the whole set to generate the weighting function. Um, and you might consider um, what expertise you have about the data um, and choices of the weighting function. So this builds a vital bridge between the fields of topological data analysis and machine learning. Um, for more information, I'll direct you to the tutorial on machine learning and persistence images where they walk through an interesting example. And um, there's a link to the paper um, where this is um, introduced and discussed below. So thank you so much for your time.